Uh, it is really an honor to uh, be part of this morning's program and to help celebrate the uh, Foundation's 75th anniversary. That is a long time to do a lot of great work. Starting, I'm told, with the St. Paul Foundation's very first grant, maybe you know this, uh, back in the early 50s, the St. Paul Foundation bought a record player so that uh, to help uh, immigrants learn to speak English. It was a great grant at the time, seems as relevant today as it was when they made the grant. I mean, it really is pretty terrific. So congratulations, St. Paul Foundation. I have to say, sharing a stage with five mayors of my adopted hometown is a, is a real treat. We've had great leadership in the city of St. Paul. I think you all agree with that. Some great mayors. I'm a little worried, though. I'm a little worried, though, as Carlene alluded to. Uh, an hour is a long, long, long time. These gentlemen are so shy, introverted, <laughs> reserved. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little worried they're not going to want to speak up. But we'll do the best we can. What we're going to do, each of the mayors uh, has been asked to talk for a minute or two about his experience working with the foundation and the philanthropic community. Uh, then they'll have a chance to talk among themselves about their experiences. And uh, finally, we will be taking some audience questions. So get your question ready, and uh, we'll get a microphone to you. So let's do this in chronological order and start with former Mayor Larry Cohen, who served the city from 1972 to 1976. Mayor Cohen. Can you hear me? Uh, as I was looking through scrapbooks for today's events, I was struck by the headlines of the St. Paul newspaper 43 years ago. Uh, revamped the Met Console. <laughs> City attorney investigates charge of police brutality. Uh, St. Paul helped to probe charge of two policemen beating black students. 35E Boulevard planned. <laughs> And the airport heights the parking fees <laughs> to, 15 cent, to 50 cents an hour with 15 cents for each additional hour. <laughs> it should only be that now. I see that during the early uh, 1970s, many individuals began to establish uh, foundation to benefit uh, the community. Uh, Harold Bend, Ralph Creasel, Mary Lou Deezer, and Grace Flandreau. Uh, these are now part of the St. Paul Foundation. Andy Boss, John Nassif, and Archie Givens. The St. Paul Foundation grants grew from $400,000 to $2,400,000 in 1975. I found re uh, references to uh, O'Shaughnessy uh, gifting a special design fountain for O'Shaughnessy Plaza in 1975. Uh, 73, and he was the largest contributor to Catholic education in this country. In 1974, the Bush Foundation gave one million to the St. Paul Ramsey Council of Arts and Science to support renovation of the old Federal Court Building, now known as Landmark Center. 
1974, Ramsey County Human Services asked the Guild of Catholic Women to provide a boarding home for people with mental illness when state hospitals uh, closed. And in 1974, Bill McKnight asked his daughter, Virginia McKnight Binger, to lead the McKnight Foundation, and she established the formal grand making and the uh, community-based approach that remains the foundation legacy today. It was a uh, Mayor Coleman, or, or Cohen, could you uh, put the mic on? Yeah, it was a profound uh, uh, responsibility uh, to be the mayor of St. Paul, and I enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> mayor Larry Cohen. All right. Uh, next up with a, a couple of thoughts uh, on his time serving as mayor, George Latimer, St. Paul's longest serving mayor. He was in office from 1976 to 1990. George? Thank you. Uh, I think Larry Cohan and his opening remark, he, he got elected first with the name Cohan. <laughs> People in St. Paul thought he was Irish. It never could have happened otherwise. Uh, but. But the, the, the feeling of history that he conveys is so important to understanding philanthropy and community. Uh, I think that it's wonderful that we're all and been invited, but it's also a little misleading to try to carve out a great cities and great communities growth and evolution into segments of two or four years. Uh, in fact, the community is not segmented. The community is not like a, a block of granite. The community is like a great river. And it's changing, and yet it's also staying the same. And philanthropy is about, I looked this up, uh, somebody had one of those machines and came, <laughs> came from the Greek. What I, I'd forgotten, uh, I knew it, it meant loving something. And it, it, it's, philanthropy is about loving humanity. Uh, but philanthropy in St. Paul, and it should be all of humanity, and the St. Paul Foundation has never forgotten that it's about all of humanity and not just some of humanity that we honor. And the community has evolved over these years, and two or three things strike me that are specific to St. Paul uh, and also extend more generally to philanthropy. And the one I've touched on already is the continuity of the community. But that carries with it, because we are, after all, St. Small, it carries with it this wonderful parochialism. And if we're to be honest here and out there, we recognize that the tension created by the love of place and parochialism, we call it, where are you from? Are you from St. Paul? No, I'm from St. Mark's Parish. <laughs> I, I, I'm from the east side. I'm from Island Park. And that really is good, because that means that they owned, the people who say that own that special place. It's helped to shape them, and they've helped to shape that. And I'll keep within two minutes by simply saying, I prepared for this by thinking a lot and by calling three people, and uh, they happen to be John Manillo, Jack Heschler, and Mary Picard. And uh, has anyone ever had a short conversation with Jack Heschler? <laughs> so the other two uh, covered a lot of territory in a very short amount of time, and Jack covered a very little amount of material in <laughs> a very long time. Um, but listening to all three of them uh, really underscored for me a couple of things about the sense of community. Nearly everything that my administration was involved in had lineage long before. So whether it was Lower Town, 
was basically the, the vision of B.J. Mears, and it was in the late 60s and early 70s, and Hella, his widow, carried it forward, and that was to reconstruct that great first beginning warehouse section of St. Paul into a great residential urban village, and that's what we sought to do. But it began much before my administration, and simply, and in addition to that, all of the other initiatives. I promised myself I'd stop at two minutes, so there are two or three jewels that you will be deprived of now, <laughs> because my inner clock says, okay, laddie, two minutes. I don't, uh, George Mill, George Latimer. <clears throat> I don't think we're going to have trouble filling the hour. Uh, all right, next up, uh, former Mayor Jim Scheibel, who served from 1990 to 1994. Mayor Scheibel. Um, thanks, Gary. It's always so easy to follow George. <laughs> Um, and I belong right in the middle, don't I? Uh, <laughs> so. um, in, in thinking about, um, I, I tried to think about things we have in common, all of us, some of the challenges and, and things we did. And, and if you go back to our State of the City speeches, all of ours, we all said the city was in good shape. So we have that in common. Uh, <laughs> And we also all always face there's challenges ahead that we don't rest on laurels of the past. Um, and I, I was thinking particularly the role of philanthropy, and, and I was thinking what are some issues that all of us really share? Um, and, and I think of particularly like the immigrants that have always have called St. Paul its home and the priority and the work we have addressed to immigrants, again with the help of philanthropy. Um, ho housing is critical, and I think St. Paul has one of the best track records of creating housing for all, um, um, anywhere. And, and I wish Randy Kelly was here today, because when I think of his administration, he did an amazing job focusing on housing um, with Susan Kimberly and others in setting that goal. Um, and I think that's something that we all share. There's always been um, an appreciation of the culture and the arts in our community. Um, and again, it's philanthropy that has helped us focus on that and celebrate that in our community. And today, St. Paul is 47% people of color. And I think we all have in common that we want to celebrate and work to celebrate that diversity. Um, I have a question for you. I teach these days at Hamlin, so I love giving a little quiz. And I ask you to look around the room here, and can you count five people that you have done business with? <laughs> so, he, uh, so all those of you who can look around this room and say you've done business with five people, raise your hands. <laughs> well done. <laughs> but, I think that's the key. Philanthropy in St. Paul isn't only about dollars, but the St. Paul Foundation, if they were gonna be involved, they said everybody has to be at the table. So the human services, business, labor, the way we get things done, and I think it's part of the incredible strength of this city. It isn't just about money, but it's about people sharing common goals and working together. So I look forward to an extended conversation. Thanks. Mayor Jim Scheibel. Uh, next up, uh, Mayor Norm Coleman, who served from uh, 1994 to 2002. Thank you, thank you, Gary. And, and, and like uh, Senator Cohen, I, I never denied my Irish lineage uh, <laughs> coming from that great line of Coleman's long history in St. Paul. Uh, when, I, when I reflected upon city, my vision of city building, I always kind of saw it as, as kind of a three-legged stool. And one, one part of that stool was the public sector, second part was the private sector, but third was the foundation, the, the, the nonprofit sector. And, 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 and so I, I needed all three, and certainly on the, on the foundation side, you can think about the projects. So we, we get a loss in software, a thousand employees coming in, and, and we get a, a, an aesthetically pleasing parking ramp out of that. <laughs> but important though, because it's part of city building, and, 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 and the science museum connecting downtown and the, and the river, and that, that little slice of uh, right across from Landmark Center that Jerry Grunhofer gives to the city, but somebody needed to raise $1.5 million to make it a park, and where does that come from? 
comes from the, the St. Paul Foundation. But, but beyond the projects, to me what was most important was the assistance in, in shaping the vision. Paul Verrett came up to me early in my, my mayorality and said that he, he, he gently suggested that, that, I, <laughs> that, that I connect with this Latimer acolyte named Dick Broker, okay? Uh, and that it would be a, a good thing to do. Now, you have to understand, a gentle suggestion from Paul Verrett is like Vito Corleone in The Godfather making you an offer that you cannot refuse. Okay? Of course you can't refuse it. And, and, and I did. And, and I kind of dreamed of a city that's huge from black and white. Broker dreamed in 3D and multicolors. He could see the downtown connected with the river. And, and so he, 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 he made it happen. In addition, then, it, the people, the, the incredible philanthropy, philanthropy here, the folks like Carl Drake, Heschler has been mentioned, Tom McEwen's been here, Billy Young, uh, Mrs. Muir has been, I mean, stunning. These are folks, by the way, who had, they, they pulled in Ben Thompson's vision of this great river and saw it and then kind of did the things to make it happen. What they did with their great commitment to, to community, to, 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 to building community, is they allowed St. Paul to kind of fight way above its weight when it comes to community building. Last story, one quick story about, Benny, about Mears, Mears and, I'll, and I'll be gone. One day we, had, we knew that we wanted to bring people down to the river. That was important. And so Patrick Seep is here. We came up with this idea. How about having Bobby McFerrin and the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra do a concert on a barge right across the Navy Island on the river? Well, figured we'd get people down. They'd see how beautiful this river is. Sure enough, we plan it. It ends up to be a glorious late September summer day. Thousands of people come to the river. And the next day, I have to be speaking to the St. Paul Garden Club. And all of a sudden, a woman, and, and, and remember I said, anybody at that event, it was beautiful, and this woman raised her hand, she said, she's Mrs. Mears, and she was there, and, and during this beautiful music, all of a sudden, this, this barge kind of came beyond it, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, and, and all of a sudden, she said, and how beautiful that was. It, it was a working river. There were the railroad tracks. There was the music. There was the barge. And when I think about the St. Paul Foundation and those connected, they, they understood kind of the core, the character of St. Paul. And what they did is they helped shape a vision for its future that was consistent with that working person city, consistent with the celebrating this great river. They, they really made it all happen to our great benefit. One of my favorite expressions, couldn't end without it, is, is Winston Churchill once said, it was the people who had the heart of the lion, and I simply had the luck to give the roar. All of us would say that. The St. Paul Foundation, my glorious, if you all had the people of St. Paul, they had the heart of the lion, and I simply was blessed to give the roar. Thank you. Mayor Norma Coleman. And uh, next up now, St. Paul's uh, current mayor, Chris Coleman, who was first elected in 2006. Mayor? I, I feel like I have to offer a rebuttal on behalf of, uh, behalf of Jack Heschler. <clears throat> <laughs> so I will just say that I didn't prepare any remarks, figuring I wouldn't get a word in edgewise with Latimer on the stage. <laughs> I, I, I want to point out, one, there is one person in the room that has a common thread through all of these administrations who served with all of us but then was married by Judge Cohen, uh, and that's Gene Carpy. So if you... So if you, if you really want to know what happens in the mayor's office, talk to her, because we'll, we'll never tell you all those secrets. Uh, it, it's an honor to be here. Norm and I ran into each other last night, and uh, I, said, I said, Norm, you have to admit, the greatest job you ever had or ever will have is Mayor of St. Paul. And I think that we all feel the same way, because this is just an extraordinary gift that we've been given to be able to run this city, to be able to have an imprint on our city. But when I think about the work that all of us have done, uh, none of it would have been possible but for the fact that we have all of you in this room that supported us, that prodded us, that moved us along, that gave us a social conscience when we were kind of focused in on other things and saying, you know, we, you know, we, we have to have a ribbon to cut because that's what mayors get judged on sometimes. Uh, but the fact of the matter, it is philanthropy. It is people, quite frankly, like Nancy Latimer, uh, who first uh, realized the importance... the importance of, of reaching out to, to the Hmong community, this, this group of folks that we had never heard of before that were now moving into our city. 
Uh, it is the work that was done to start the Lower Town uh, Redevelopment Corporation and, and supporting the work that Wei Ming and his vision, uh, because if it wasn't for that, uh, that was done so many years ago, there wouldn't be a Lower Town ballpark that we're about to open up. Uh, if it hadn't been people like Sally uh, Ordway Irvin who, uh, you know, said, "Look, at we have we have got to have a great concert hall. This beautiful urban square, which I think is one of the greatest urban squares in America, uh, would not be there. This hotel probably would not be open. Uh, Landmark Center would have been torn down, uh, and Latimer wouldn't have a building named after him uh, across the park." <laughs> So, so when I think of everything that I have done, everything that I've touched upon, and, I, and I, you know, St. Paul's got a lot of momentum, and, it, and it's a long history, and so I, somebody said it earlier, none of these things happen quickly, none of them are easy. There, it's a long, long thread that began many years ago with the vision uh, that has led to the fact that, you know, look at uh, the wild are going to start their comeback tonight. Uh, <laughs> but if... If it, hadn't, if it hadn't been for Norm having the, the, the temerity to, to call the commissioner of the NHL and say, we want hockey in this town, think about how different that we would be as a result of that. So the, so the fact of the matter, there's all of these things, but at the, at the core of it, the work that we've done on the Green Line uh, to make sure that that was an inclusive project, that we, we really made sure that there was arts incorporated into that. All of that began with philanthropy, uh, the, the Central Corridors Funders Collaborative that put in so much to make sure that the businesses that were on the avenue had the support that they needed to survive construction, uh, made that project what it was and, and made it something other than just moving people from point A to point B. In everything that we have done, uh, I, I really believe, uh, and we'll start with the St. Paul Foundation because it's your 75th anniversary, uh, but all of you that represent so many different parts of, the, of that really generous spirit of this community, uh, we simply couldn't do the work that we do, and we, we wouldn't have as much fun in this job were it not for philanthropy. Mayor Chris Coleman. <laughs> well, gentlemen, um, as we you know, think about the role that uh, philanthropy has played over your time in office all these years, uh, what's been the most important element that uh, the philanthropic community has brought to the table? The money, the leadership, the, the chutzpah? What do you think? Who wants to go first? Don't be shy. Well, let, let, I, let me just kind of answer that by way of, a, of an example. I was just out in Rochester, New York. Uh, we were asked to go out and speak to, uh, to their kind of civic group on, on behalf of folks that were trying to get a, uh, a vision going around their riverfront. Uh, the Genesee River is one of the most amazing rivers. It runs right through the middle of, of Rochester. It has three amazing waterfalls on it, and you have to work really hard to see those waterfalls. You have to work really hard to get down to that river. Uh, and this unbelievable asset is, is not being utilized. And Rochester you know, got gut punched by the loss of Eastman Kodak and, and all the jobs that left there. Went from one of the richest towns in America to one of the poorest towns in America. But what I really realized when I, was, when I was there was how lucky we were in the city of St. Paul to have had the Paul Verrettes that worked with the Dick Brokers, that went, you know, whether it was through, you know, through uh, George originally or ultimately through the work that's being done today by the Riverfront Corporation. It was, it, money, is, of course, is important. But that vision that was set and that, that kind of instilling this idea that the river was going to regenerate the, the future of the city of St. Paul, uh, just as that had originally given birth to us, that was the most important piece for me, which was it, it was the keeper of the vision, uh, as, as Norm said, the heart of the lion. Uh, it, it is just amazing what you do. So, of course, money is important. Uh, keep on giving. Um, <laughs> but... Keep on, keep on pushing us to do better, and that's how we ultimately achieve what we can achieve. Let me just add one, one thing to that. And by the way, we do like the money, very, very important. <laughs> uh, but but it, I talk about sustained commitment. So George, you had the vision of Riverfront way, way before. You were out there kind of pitching that. But you know, I had the benefit of, of uh, when I was mayor, that we had Bill Marsh and Catherine Brown, hailed by the New York Times as the greatest urban design minds in America. They're in our backyard. I, I can't, I'm, I'm not getting through the city two years of, of sh neighborhood charrettes commitment to do that, to, to, so they get every neighborhood in St. Paul committed to the river, but the but St. Paul Foundation can do that. So the sustained commitment to do the things, kind of the value added that we simply can't do, that make a difference between good and excellent or nothing and good. And, and so they made it happen. Uh, great vision, right, right timing, but then sustained commitment. And, and 
Um, I always appreciated philanthropy. There was this vision, but there was also a sense of who are we really and what's reality and sort of building on that and sort of pushing. And at the same time with the river, things like the Children's Museum, there's so many things we celebrate. Our philanthropic community, and I think all of us also realize we have other challenges um, in this city. So I see Tom McEwen. And so we were a community that said, let's create and rebuild and, and celebrate our river, but let's not forget that 22% today of the people in the city of St. Paul still live in poverty. And Tom, with the effort with St. Paul Company, said, we are gonna have housing, we are gonna serve all with the Dorothy Day Center. So I really appreciate it was sort of this, let's push ourselves, but let's make sure we have a city that's accessible to, to all. Yeah, I, yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Tim, for reminding us of that. And on Friday morning at 7.30, Doug Baker, one of the great CEOs in the state and the country, and also of uh, uh, St. Paul, is going to give the keynote at the Dorothy Day Center. Uh, that's a profound comment about the connection between the corporate power centers and the least among us, and it, it fits with what you're saying. I would like to add two other things that are a little bit technical for people who just came here to applaud and eat bacon. Um, <laughs> but I think there are two uh, roles uh, that uh, philanthropy has to play that is essential. One is risk. No one wants to talk about risk. But the truth is, building cities and building companies and building neighborhoods all takes risk. And you have to measure the risk and you have to be willing to absorb it, and you're willing to own it. And so if you think about the risks that people have taken, for example, this hotel, four people, who, rich people, at least in Minnesota, like to be anonymous, at least until they have a building named after them. Um, <laughs> but there were four people when this place was boarded up uh, who were asked to be stakeholders a very technical phrase, which means they bought into about three and a half million dollars of debt. And we had no idea that they'd ever be paid off, but they did it so that we had a transition in which we could rebuild, restore this wonderful place. That happened because four rich people in St. Paul, I know they don't like to be called rich, but uh, I don't think it's bad, it's okay. Um, <laughs> And, and it, they took that risk. Well, like those kinds of risks are taken in small ways as well. And the second point I want to make besides risk is the notion of starting with fledglings, and that too is connected with risk. So remember that I, don't, I didn't see Christine Potus Larson this morning, but Christine came up with a public art St. Paul idea 20, 25 years ago, she's about to step down. Uh, Mary Picard was at the St. Paul companies and started very small grant makings to fledgling community groups. And one of them had to do with public art. And look what, how it's flourished. Another had to do with historic preservation. And I, I saw Colleen Carey when I was here. And look how historic preservation has become a monumental part of our city. That we just wouldn't be the same if we hadn't preserved all the great, all the great architecture that we have. And so, uh, investing in the fledglings, and or there's another one. There's um, what's the art um, in? Um, you see, without staff, I don't have any staff anymore. <laughs> um, somebody help me out there. They, they, they started the art cooperative in Lower Town. Art space, everybody knows art space. I knew it was art space, you don't have to tell me. <laughs> so art space is now a national, not-for-profit corporation called upon all over the country to do what they started here in St. Paul with a few thousand dollars from the St. Paul companies when Mary was, I mean, that's, so we, we all, treasure the large monumental gifts, but let's not forget the importance. 
especially in a place where the neighborhoods are so strong and so loved by people. Mayor Co uh, Cohen, you want to weigh in? Yes. <laughs> uh, Better move fast while you can get a word in edgewise here. <laughs> uh, a, a great philanthropist was John Nassif. And John Nassif and his wife, uh, Helene, have uh, contributed a great deal to St. Paul. And, uh, and might I mention West Publishing Company? So we've got a lot of famous things that started in St. Paul. 3M, West Publishing, and uh, it's what? Ecolabs. Yeah. Ecolabs. 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 Wow. Okay. <laughs> you know, I think the three the three M story is a great one because the way that began it was up in two harbors around 1905, right. and uh, Ordway who, uh, the name has become famous, but basically he made pipes, as I recall, and he made money along with pipes, and he went up there, and for $25,000 loan to 3M of Two Harbors, he said, I'll lend you the money, provided you move down to St. Paul, where I can keep my eye on it. <laughs> and that's what happened. 3M came here. I, I'm not, I don't give that as an example of how we grow our industry, but it is a historical fact <laughs> that then Two Harbors has never forgiven us. But, I, but I, I, it's an interesting point because it's one of the roles I think philanthropy is going to have to play as we go forward here because the same thing that happened to Two Harbors from a guy in St. Paul is happening to us from people in Silicon Valley right now. And so if we're going to keep the, this incredible economy that we have here, uh, we got to stop people from going out to California because somebody's saying, I'll give you the money, but I want to keep an eye on you. And I think that that's a, a role that, that you know, we, we've got to figure out and do it better. You know, we made some adjustments, we made some changes, but we're still losing those companies uh, that are the future of the city of St. Paul. So I would, not that you asked the question, what do you think the future role of philanthropy is, but I know you were getting there. Uh, and, <laughs> and I would just plant that as a seed of something that we really have got to think about as we move forward because we don't want to have happen to us what happened to two harbors uh, many years ago. What do the rest of you uh, gentlemen think about the future of philanthropy here in St. Paul? <laughs> Funny you should ask. I I've listened to you so many years, Gary. I know what you're going to ask. I just know. Let, let me just we'll kind of go down the list here. I, I, I still believe that, that philanthropy is, is still value-added. So there's kind of a fundamental responsibility of, of government to kind of do the things that it has to do to kind of provide a framework, a place for people who want to you know, raise their families. It's got to be safe, got to have good schools, got to grow jobs. And so you, we can't put that all on, on philanthropy. You know, I mean, during my time, I had Tom Kingston over at Wilder, and, and I had uh, O'Keefe over, over at McKnight. And, and you know, so Kingston's doing stuff on the west side of St. Paul. I couldn't do it all myself, but I had to be on the west side. I had to be doing stuff in the Chicano community, and I couldn't leave it to, to, to the foundation community. So, again, if you go back to my three-legged stool, private sector, the public sector, and the nonprofit, the, the nonprofit sector is an offshoot of the private sector. That if we have a robust private sector, if we're generating wealth in this community, then you're going to have philanthropy. And so I think it's a responsibility of government, actually, the, the, to do those things that create an environment in which people want to grow jobs. They want to raise their families. And if they do that, then you'll get this robust... Private sector, philanthropic community comes out of that, and they can do, Chris and, and, and George, you know, the risk stuff. Government is that not, but if I got, you know, same, they'll come in and they'll take a risk on something that no one else would do, and, and I think that's a, a proper and appropriate role for them. Mayor Scheibel, future uh, for philanthropic uh, activity? Um, we need everybody's money because we've got a lot to build on, um, but I also think some of the challenges um, some big challenges remain ahead, and I think philanthropy will play a role in that. And just a couple, um, speaking as um, Minnesota president of AERP, um, it was really troubling to me this Monday to read in the paper from the other side of the river on the front page the number of people 50 and over that are homeless. 
And even more so, we are an aging population. Uh, the great thing about St. Paul is people don't want to leave this city. Um, but I think we need to really look at what is that going to mean in the future. And I think that's, you know, the role of philanthropy is to be there a partner with business and with government. To say, how do we ensure a high quality of life for people of all ages, including those 50 and over? And on the other end, and I really, Chris, Mayor Coleman has really focused about our young people. I'm so encouraged by the young people I teach at Hamlin. Um, they understand philanthropy. They understand th the need to give. But also, maybe it's part of I get older, I look at the challenges they're going to face. And I think philanthropy has a real role. We need to engage those young people. We have to make them feel this is their city. They have something at stake, and they want to participate. Um, and so I think those are just a couple of the challenges um, that we have. And I foresee philanthropy a lot of times is there encouraging and being the leader and saying, going back to Norm, what is that vision? And then how do we work together as a community to accomplish those goals? I don't think, we, I don't think you ought to be too modest about where you are now. Because um, I can remember when Mayor Coleman, uh, I mean Norm's nephew, I don't mean Norm, but uh, <laughs> when, when Norm's nephew, Chris, ran for the first time. He, he talked about kids, and people would scratch their heads and say, he's running for mayor, what's he talking about kids for? Uh, the St. Paul Foundation, seven, eight years ago, took on the issue, they said we have to deal with a public conversation around the issues of race, as well as our children. And I think, however painful it is, However tired we get of it, if we don't deal with the issues of the very young, the very poor, and people of color uh, who are disproportionately poor, then we will not be as beautiful and as livable and as lovable as we are now. Uh, let me ask all of you, uh, Mayor Cohen, let, let me start with you. How does a, the philanthropic community uh, by the way, I want to get to audience questions, so get your questions ready, wave your hand, and Ann or Jeremy will get a microphone to you and we'll move into audience questions. But meanwhile, while we're getting that set up, I want to ask each of you, how does the uh, philanthropic community here in St. Paul compare with other cities? A chance to thump your chest a little bit, or ch thump their chest, I guess. St. Paul, sir. Could you put your mic up, sir? Yeah. St. St. Paul does very well. Uh, I, I think uh, we, we are one of the best cities around mm -hmm. for giving. What do the rest of you think, gentlemen? I think we ought to do a lot better. I think you got to dig deeper. I mean, it is great to, to talk about, there's so many great examples. I mean, if you just think the people that were named, the organizations that have been called out by us, um, they're all there in part because of philanthropy and caring about the city. Um, but George, I agree. I mean, we've, you need to give more. I, I mean, I am concerned. If you look at the many needs we have in a changing community, and we're part of an, uh, a metropolitan area, um, I think we do need to be a little more bullish. There's some challenges in the city that we have. Um, and we can applaud ourselves what we should, but hopefully it should be more of an encouragement and incentive to go out and say, we can be the best, and continue to, to um, support the other. Can I trail on this, uh, lest I be misunderstood my kidding about digging deeper. Um, we have to measure how we're doing. Good intentions are not enough. Conservatives who say that we can't throw money at the problem have some merit in that. We have to talk about reforming what we're doing and making sure that we're measuring outcomes rather than just good intentions or inputs. There is merit in that. We've got to be direct and honest about it, and we've got to be transparent about what the outcomes are as well. One of the things I would say, Gary, I, I think that what we have that's unique here, and I, this is more of a sense than hard evidence, 
uh, is the collaboration that we have between our philanthropic partners. Uh, the fact that Kate Wilford from McKnight is here uh, and Polly Tallon uh, worked with John Kulchman to, uh, to, to fund the, or to start the Central Corridor Funders Collaborative. Uh, and the work that, you know, the Bush Foundation is sitting at the table with, you know, across the board. Uh, this is, they come together and create a synergy in our community as, because, because not everybody says, has, well, this has to be a St. Paul Foundation project or this has to be a McKnight Foundation project. This is about how we come together. And so there are a lot of communities that have wealthy foundations. There are a lot of communities that have, um, you know, people that are pushing them. But I have never seen one like this community that has that cross-the-table collaboration between all of the partners in, in, in this community. And I'll, just, I'll just add to that, because I, I, that goes back to the historical thing. I mean, I got elected mayor 20-something years ago. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I heard from Paul Verrett very quickly. Uh, but it was all good. I mean, it was, again, as I said, often you can't refuse. But, so we have a long history, Gary. And the other thing is we're a big, small town. It's going to go to one of our benefits, burdens. We're not Minneapolis. Uh, you know, I have an office there now, and I wish it were here, but it's over there. What you, what no, my saying? law firm put it over there. I, okay, nothing I could do about that. But, but, but there is, you watch, you see the critical mass on, on a, on a, at, a no, at noontime, and it's pretty stunning. So we have to kind of, you've you got to play with the cards of the Delta. And so what we have is this big, small town. We have this interconnectedness. It goes back a long time. And we have a, a, a philanthropic community that's not shy. Don't be shy. Uh, and then I'll just kind of end on that, that note I said before. Uh, we have to do everything we can. I know the mayor's committed that to, to, to make sure that people want to grow jobs in this town. They want to have economic growth in this town. And if we do that across the board so that everyone benefits from it, then I think we'll have a, a robust philanthropic community. But I think it's, it's, it's this historical deep-rootedness really is to St. Paul's advantage. All right, we've got an audience question down here. Okay. Hello, I'm Robin Hickman, and I'm honored to be able to say I have so touching stories about each of you. Only you, uh, Mayor Cohen, you and my dad, you did your thing. So, um, But I, I would like to, the, the, the loudest kind of applause or kind of stirring in the room came when um, you, Mayor Cohen talked about the clips of the 70s and the issues of police relations, community relations, and the irony that those are the, the issues that we face today. And Mayor Latimer, as you talked about going deeper, some of you are, and having worked with or walked with most of you, um, that the 70s, 2015, some of the same issues we're dealing with. Issues of opportunity gaps, disparities. And I know each of you and I know your commitments to those things. I've got to walk with you. But how do we find ourselves 40 years later addressing some of those same issues that many of the, the, the least among us and not so much the least among us have to still confront? Gentlemen. Robin. Um, one of the things I hear you saying, um, philanthropy, I don't think, can be top down. And that if we're really going to address the issues, our diversity, some of the feelings, and, and St. Paul has had a tradition for all of us of having the neighborhood, the people at the table. And I think that's really an important role. We, we can't, we, we need to be talking to the young people today, the people that you're working with. We need to hear their voice. We need to make sure they have a place at the table. Um, so the past is something great to build on, but we have to have the, the people on the streets today, the young people, the old people, saying, having a say in, in what this city is gonna look like. So they feel they have something at stake. They're true stakeholders in building this city. Robin. You're all right, go ahead. There's an old saying, the more things change, the more they stay the same. You know, you know the, uh, the, first of all, obviously every community in this country is dealing with the same challenges that we have and we have some advantages over some communities and as we all know, we have some disadvantages because we continue to have one of the most persistent achievement gaps. 
Uh, but part of the thing, you know, that we need to start talking about that differently. The fact that we even use the term achievement gap uh, suggests kind of, you know, this, it's a deficit language. It's, it's a, we, need, we need to change our language about uh, how we talk about our kids of color particularly. Uh, and so that we're lifting them up instead of, you know, just kind of reinforcing the fact that they're, 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 they're uh, it was mentioned at the Generation Next meeting yesterday, you know, that we can all cite the statistics for, for Latino youth uh, about, you know, rates of unemployment, rates of, uh, of uh, per teen pregnancy, rates of drop, you know, dropping out of school. We, we know those, but what, what we don't have is we have an asset mapped in our, our communities. And so that's you know, the work that you're doing and, and going out and letting the, the children tell their voices so that we're actually reflecting the work uh, that they want to have happen, not what we think should happen. And so resources become a key part of that, but the work, the collaboration that we have. Uh, yesterday in, in Gen Next, which for you, uh, I hope all of you know what that is, but it's the, you know, the cross collaboration uh, to try to deal with uh, educational attainment and preparing our young people, all of our young people for success in life. We added a bandwidth uh, on social emotional learning because we focused in on you know reading level by grade th you know at, at level th uh, grade three level on time graduating on time all of those factors but we kind of forgot that there's a whole lot that goes into making that possible and it's not just sitting there doing doing drills in a classroom it's about creating an environment where that child feels like they're capable of achieving anything and a lot of times that happens outside the classroom so I truly believe that the, the sprockets work that we're doing the work that we're doing in promised neighborhood that create a support network for what's happening in our classrooms ultimately in Dolores Henderson's walking through I uh, allow her to be that much more successful because we created a community where Dolores can teach. And, and I would just say, Robin, that, that, you know, this is a race without a finish line on those issues. You know, Tim Marks, how long have you been, been, been fighting homelessness? But you, and you're going to keep at it. Now, we had, during my administration, we had some, some challenges uh, that would have ignited, but I had Nick Khalif in the NAACP, I Corky Finney as chief of police, and I think in some other city that may have exploded. But kind of the nature of the relationships that we have here, I, I think, kind of calm that down. So race without a finish line, we have to keep on keep at it. But I don't think there's an easy answer to, to the question that you raise. Mayor Latimer, want to weigh in? There are there are pilots occurring all over the community, and many of them are ethnic and race based, and deserve a lot of attention. Uh, certainly, Ujama is an organization that's mentoring uh, men who've been in trouble, but ha have an ama thus far, after two or three years, an amazing reduction of recidivism. Amazing. So we have pilots all over that we know are working, and we need to get the best brain power. I talked earlier about measurement. We need to figure out how to take to scale what is already evidently. Uh, I see in the audience is Bill Malam, who 25 years ago started the Immigrant Law Center. Well, the Immigrant Law Center does a lot more than defend immigrants. It also assists them in opening the doors of real opportunity and not just being in the shadows afraid and not knowing whether you ever be treated as a free citizen. So uh, organizations like those need more and more identification. I've come, and, and the number of Hmong uh, organizations that began years ago and are flourishing, and to have now a great young councilman who's Hmong, two school board members that I've known are Hmong, this ought to be great pride to us. The greatest urban population among in the world is here. The second largest population in America, because many of them are in Fresno and the Valley. And so my, my views have changed over the years. And so I, I believe that we don't, we who are not um, the same folks we're trying to help, we're, we're not from the same background, we look maybe a little, I don't look so different, but some of you do. Um, <laughs> We need to assist people to help themselves. And we do identify, especially the new immigrants, especially African Americans and, and other ethnic groups. They do, by definition, by history, 
identify themselves first as where they came from. And we have to honor that and not pretend it can be disguised and turned into white bread. And so I'm more inclined to support a variety of community-based, ethnic-centered reach outs than perhaps I was 30 years ago. This is, uh, I think this is one of the, the key points. Somebody mentioned that philanthropy can do things that the, the public sector can't do. Uh, and, and I think that this is very critical because when we create programs, it's really hard for us to say we're only gonna have a program for this group of people or for that group of people. So we tend to kind of create a, a big, broad brush that, we, that we're painting with. And philanthropy allows us to go in and do deep dives. So we're not talking about the Asian community. We're talking about the Hmong community, uh, the Korean community, uh, really kind of understanding the distinctions. We're not just talking about African Americans. We're talking about Somali Americans and Ethiopian Americans and uh, uh, you, you know, just across the board. And, and my brother's keeper initiative, which the president started and where uh, Mayor Hodges and I have really picked up that challenge, uh, to really say, you know what, young men of color uh, are really struggling in our community, and we have to have very specific strategies, uh, and not just, uh, again, even a broad brush there, we have to have very specific strategies for each one of our groups of young men, and, and, and African American boys are really struggling in that, and we have to call it out and be able to say, what are the specific strategies for African American boys, not for young people, uh, for African American boys? And, and philanthropy can allow us to do that in a way that if it was just a government sector thing, we wouldn't be able to do. Let's go over to uh, this side of the room. Another question for the mayors. Isn't this wonderful, these guys all at one, one place? This is terrific. Go ahead, please. Hi, I'm Sarah Fossen, and as mayors, you have leveraged so many public or pub, private funds for public purpose. And I would be fascinated to hear what your kind of most memorable or most challenging project was during your term. But I would also love to hear going forward, what do you feel must happen for St. Paul? All right, let's start right here with the current mayor. Uh, well, I. I have to wait until I'm done with uh, my term in order to say what my best thing was. I don't, it may, it may still be coming, I don't know. Uh, but there's a lot that we can do, and, and, and George mentioned Christine Potus Larson. As I think he actually mentioned everybody in the room so far. Um, there's, a table, there's a table over here, George, you didn't get to, and I think they're gonna be quite offended. Um, but you know, I'll just take one, uh, one on my to-do list, uh, Pedro Park. Uh, the, the space in downtown St. Paul that the uh, annex to the old police department is still on. Um, we need to dream big on that. I mean, we have Mears Park and Rice Park, two of the finest urban spaces in America. But uh, how about doing our version of Millennial Park from Chicago down there? How about doing our version of even uh, the, the sculpture garden over in Minneapolis? And to just to, to elevate that beyond kind of what our St. Paul comfort level is, to have a, a, a remarkable and world-renowned uh, park that people are going to come to just to be there in that space. Uh, that's just one example of, of where I'd like to say, you know, we have this incredible opportunity, uh, but we have to dream big, uh, and we can't be uh, afraid to get outside of our comfort. Mayor Coleman? I, I, I agree with Chris. It, it is about dream big. I, I had two things that, that couldn't have... It, we just didn't do it by ourselves. You know, so, so we had Lawson Software by way of example. I remember calling Doug Leatherdale on a Friday night. And so I got the opportunity to bring 1,000 jobs to St. Paul, but they don't have the credit to kind of get the building. So I need someone to take a lease on one of the floors. And, and there's a Friday night, and, and, and Leatherdale said, I can do that. Now, now, I don't think they could do it today in this environment. But, but for, for me, I do have to say, and I think it's important, and others would agree, that the kind of personal relationship that you had. So that relationship that I had with, with Leatherdale as a friend, you know, the same thing when we did the Wild Deal. It was, you know, with Al Schumann, there were personal relationships that you have to have uh, that go beyond, you know, we kind of hang out in our little political worlds and hang out with our political folks and get involved in our little political battles. Uh, but, but in the end, kind of the personal relationships with the folks that are creating jobs, the, the folks that are kind of be there to give you that extra assist when you can't do it by yourself, I think really made a difference uh, in, in, in kind of what I was able to do, that I could go to folks then uh, and simply say, okay, I need you now, and they were there because it wasn't the first time that I was calling them. But I do want to come back to Chris Ultimately, and, and I love what's going on in Lower Town, and, you know, Wayming has to look at that and say, you know, where we, look how far we've come. But all of those about dreaming big. As I said before, the benefit of having Dick Broker is you know, dreaming in 3D and, and, and multicolors. 
And if you do that, this town has the capacity, I think, to kind of pull things together to actually get it done. Mayor Schiavo? A um, few things come to mind, but it's really hard to choose or pick out a couple things because each day and each week can be such a joy and there can be so much success. Um, uh, a few that come to mind, um, one was, um, it was exciting for me to see William Yang who worked right in my office. And working with the community, particularly the Hmong America Partnership, we started a program on Saturday um, at Como for the immigrant community, for the Hmong to come and learn everything, how to fix windows, to learn about the justice system. Um, I loved working with the youth in my office and studying programs like Public Achievement where youth did politics. And today that program's in hundreds of cities in the United States and 16 different countries. And, and um, I think we all have a soft spot in our, spot in our heart for our sister cities. And, and one of the, the joys was working with the Nagasaki Sister, sister City Committee and um, there's a peace park we all know in Nagasaki, and there was not any sculpture from the United States. So it was the sister, um, sister city committee, particularly with the support of Cray and, and some other people, that today in a central place in the park in Nagasaki is the sculpture and testament to the United States, the relationships be, relationship between J Japan and the United States. So. Um, there's so many. We, we could fill the morning probably talking about great things that happened. Mayor Latimer? Uh, Cohan and I are at the uh, elder end of the demographic, and speaking for myself, I've forgotten the question. <laughs> but, but I'll make one up. Um, If you're talking about what happened, I, I meant what I said earlier deeply, and that is we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. And therefore, I really don't think, I, I don't think of it in terms of this is what we did, but rather this is what we did together over a long period. But a few of the highlights, the Job Corps, many people were very skeptical of it, worried about the neighborhood. Now we have 10,000 young people who have gone through that system, found uh, work, 91% placement rate. I think that's better than Harvard's right now. That makes me, that gives me hope, not about just about the Job Corps, but about what we were all talking about here, and that is making sure those opportunities are available to the, all the kids at the earliest possible time. Then there's the Ordway, there's district energy and things of that kind. But I, I want to leave with this just one little story. I was at the old prom ballroom, and uh, Andy Young, Andrew Young, uh, was our uh, guest speaker. And I was surrounded by stars, and I, of course, was full of myself. And, uh, and the, the prom ballroom, Waitress came and poured coffee, poured coffee, poured coffee, and, and then to me, and then looked at me, and she said, Mayor Latimer? And I looked up, and I figured she wanted my autograph or something. I said, yes. She said, Mayor Latimer, and she put the coffee pot down between me and Andy Young. She said, Mayor Latimer, I live off of Lexington Avenue, and you're, and you're building that boulevard, and you may think that's beautiful, but I got to drive eight blocks around in order to get back to where I want to go. And I, I think you ought to talk more. And I, I thought that was so beautiful. <laughs> that woman understood who owns the city. Mayor Cohen, you get the last word. Uh, proudest achievement? I into the mic, please. How many... Uh ex-mayors are from New York. <laughs> where, where are you from, Chabel? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Nary a Minneapolitan in the group. <laughs> well, we're out of time. We need to wrap this up. And Mr. Mayors, 
Thank you so much for uh, being here and for all you've done for the service.